We can do it. Yes, we can. We can change things throughout the land. But we all must lend a hand. We can do it. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, your neighbor over there. A bit bewildered, but he cares. Welcome to Changing Our World. My name is Linda Weltner, and I'm your host today. And we have a guest today who grew up in Marblehead, graduated from Marblehead High School in 06. He's just a hometown boy, but he's put a lot of miles on the airplanes, I guess, <laughs> not, not on his car. Because you went to George Washington University, right? Yep, that's correct. Which is in Washington? Yep. Very, very good uh, mesh there with the name. And graduated when? I graduated in 2010. Uh, with? I got a degree in International Affairs from the Elliott School of International Affairs there. And then you decided you wanted to go on in International Affairs, so? Uh, I enrolled in a master's program after that, uh, and it's a program in Middle East Studies, and so I'm about three quarters of the way through that program now. I'll be graduating in uh, May of uh, next year. But you were, so you were interested in international matters, and that started when you were in high school, mm -hmm. right? And you took two trips to Honduras. For why? Uh, so we did a basically a humanitarian mission. Uh, I went twice. Um, and, with whom? Uh, it was with an uh, Episcopal Church group. Uh, that from we Marblehead? From uh, Boston. Oh, okay. And uh, Trinity Church in Boston. And we actually went there, and the first time we were helping construct a uh, foundation for a building there. And the second time we went back, we helped in the construction of a uh, community building that the community could use because the local government's very poor and they don't have much capacity to, to bring these sort of things. So and did you speak any Spanish? Had you taken Spanish in high school? No right? Spanish, unfortunately. So I had to get by with what I could. You know, I, I learned how to say a few phrases. But. Did that appeal to you? Is that what sort of gave you the wanderlust? Had you traveled with your family? Not much before then. I'd been to a few places, uh, you know, to Canada and to, you know, across the country. But that was really my first taste of uh, travel abroad. And it kind of, I, when I got my passport and went out there, it kind of started, as you said, the sense of wanderlust and wanting to go out and see greater parts of the world. And did you know anything about international law? Had you been interested in that? Uh, well, I did. Uh, Mall the United Nations in high school, oh, which okay. is kind of a popular route right. for a lot of people to become interested in uh, regional politics. What country and were like you? Oh, I was a bunch of things. I, I was uh, I had a joke with my friend the other day that I said I felt like uh, it was a sign I was getting older that two or three countries that I'd represented that the regimes had had revolutions in the past couple years. So I was Iraq before Saddam was gone, and I was Libya before Gaddafi fell. So. Oh my. <laughs> So I've, I was doing it for a while, and after that, I, um, you know, I was interested in international affairs, and that's kind of when I started uh, doing some scholarships overseas. And and your first, the first scholarship, uh, took you where? I went to Egypt in the summer of 2007. It was a State Department funded scholarship, which is beginning Arabic to start studying that. I was there for about two months and I studied the local Egyptian dialect and also heard the formal Arabic so that when I came back to the States the next fall I really sort of went into and started uh, focusing on it. Uh, and lot. you took Arabic at school as well? Yeah I kind of continued taking Arabic in at George Washington and then um, the next summer again I traveled abroad. I went to Yemen in the summer of 2008 and uh, learned, uh, learned that uh, dialect which is sort of closer to the classical variety of Arabic. And so you really were able to go out in the street by the end of Yemen then? Definitely by the end of yeah then I mean it was uh, uh, it's unfortunate the school has since closed and there's of course been a lot of uh, these events in Yemen over the past oh, uh, right. couple of months yeah. so uh, that avenue is not open to people who would want to do it today but uh, it was an interesting experience being there uh, when I was there. And, and you haven't practiced it since then, or have you? Uh, well, after <coughs> Yemen, I went to the United Arab Emirates, and I studied abroad okay. for a semester at the American University of Sharjah. Following that, I've traveled a little bit uh, just for touristic purposes in the region. Um, 
and uh, I'll actually uh, continue my Arabic study in the States. Um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, what was it like living uh, in the Middle East? And they're, they're fairly liberal, right? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting set of contrasts. So you have a lot of wealth in the country. You also have that sort of contrast against the large number of uh, the expatriate population right. that a lot of the laborers are, are very poor. So only 9%, at least when I was there, of the population was actually local Emiratis living in the country. The remaining 91% was all foreigners. And I was actually there during a period of a lot of change in 2008 when you had the, uh, the financial system, uh, the collapse, collapse that started then. And I heard stories about, you know, uh, Ferraris being parked at the airport and people taking off, uh, leaving their debts behind and leaving the country because it's so many of these capital flows, money moving in and out so fast that uh, Dubai in particular among all the Emirates was very uh, hit so hard could by you, this. So could you go to the airport and come home with a Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I should have thought of that at the time, but uh, Try I, to get a key. I didn't have a Ferrari to lose, fortunately. Um, and were the women wearing burqas and things? Uh, it's, it's uh, again, it's kind of a series of contrasts. Um, you know, a lot of the local women were more conservative. They would wear the, uh, but they would just wear the hijab and, and sort of conservative dress. But, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of Americans, Europeans that live there as well. And obviously they don't don the local attire. And would the wealthy um, people from the Emirates, w w were they, more modern and sophisticated, or were they when they were in there? When they were there, did they have to cover up? Uh, it's, I think culturally, I mean, they uh, take a lot from American culture. They listen to a lot of American music, but they're also very regionally uh, focused as well. So uh, again, you have this kind of contrast against a lot of money and wealth coming in. I mean, you have they opened up, I think, a uh, branch of the Louvre in uh, the Emirates recently, I think it was. So you have all this Western culture being exchanged and a lot of wealth sort of furthering that. But on the other side, you have this very conservative Islamic culture that undergirds it all. You know, I once read a book about a Saudi Arabian couple who usually took vacations to France. And while they were there, just behaved totally like Westerners and then came back and she, she found it very yeah. difficult to fit back into her little yeah, box. Yeah, I think you definitely see a lot of that. So then you took another turn. How did you end up in Armenia? So I've, I've focused on the Middle East a lot and uh, I've traveled pretty extensively in the region, but I thought I might do something a little tangentially related, uh, but slightly different culturally. So I actually uh, applied to go to Armenia uh, to work as an intern at the U.S. Embassy there. Was there much competition or nobody else wanted to go to uh, Armenia? No one, no one let me know, so I don't know how much <laughs> competition. There was uh, a number of interns there while I was there, so it was actually... Right, so uh, it was a desirable... They found it difficult to find housing for us all. It was uh, so many, but Armenia is an interesting country, and uh, so I think America has a kind of unique relationship with it. So it's a And you were saying that Armenia has very low uh, drug problem, mm -hmm. very low AIDS, mm -hmm. and explain to me why they're escaping the ills of modern society. I think that Armenia is uh, unique in that uh, because it's actually because of some of the political problems that surround it, uh, their relationship with Turkey, their relationship with Azerbaijan, the, the borders are actually closed. And so as a result, where you could see uh, problems with trafficking in persons or in drugs or things like this, because of these political disputes, it actually results in the country not being a conduit for this sorts of activity. So in that sense, Armenia has sort of been spared uh, by virtue of its isolation, isolation some, of the, uh, yeah. some of the difficulties that face other countries in the region. But I was surprised because I, I sort of think of it as part of Europe, mm -hmm. but one of its borders is with Iran. Yes, it's, it's very much sort of at the crux of East and West in that sense. Armenia has a very old civilization, uh, it used to be an empire whose borders were a lot larger than the modern day borders, and that sort of plays into how Armenians see themselves. Uh, Armenia was the first Christian country, formerly, formerly declared uh, by its leadership to be a Christian country, uh, and yet it's surrounded on almost all sides by countries that have traditionally been in the Islamic sphere.
you have Turkey and Azerbaijan and of course Iran, as you said, to the south that have this competing uh, uh, religious element in them. So are they, do they have the same fear that we have, you know, of, of uh, the clash between cultures? Is there friction between Muslim and Christian? I think there isn't uh, as much as one would think because Armenia is a very uh, homogeneous society. I think almost 99% of people in Armenia are Armenians, ethnically, religiously, to be Armenian in at least in their parlance and their way they think of themselves. To be Armenian is to be a member of the Armenian church, which is sort of its own unique right. ecclesiastical entity that has existed continuously. You know, it's not Catholic, it's not Orthodox, it's the Armenian church. So you have this situation when the ethnicity and the religious identity are very much coterminous. And because there isn't much diversity in the country, they see themselves as Armenians and, you know, people around them as being uh, in a different sphere. But there are a lot of Iranians because that border is open, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And they're not afraid that they're all terrorists or trying to overthrow the government or... I think that, you know, they have a pretty good relationship with Iran because, um, you know, there's a lot of Iranians that come into Armenia as tourists. Uh, they are spending money. They are uh, helping the Armenian economy. And they're not uh, necessarily going around and trying to proselytize religion or anything like that. In fact, most of the people that would visit uh, that I ran into that were Iranians in the country were more on the liberal side of and happy to be in a country that's a little less restrictive, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and one of the examples of this is the Nowruz festival that Iranians celebrate once a year. And this is, it's, it occurs in the spring. And uh, a lot of Iranians will come up into Armenia to celebrate this. and Because there's a special mosque? Uh, there's, well, there's one mosque in Yerevan. It's not so much about the mosques as it is about as you said, the more liberal culture and the opportunity to sort of celebrate more openly than they could in, uh, in um, Iran itself. So, so the point I'm making is that in, in Armenia, at least, Muslims and Christians coexist mm -hmm. without the kinds of suspicion and, and um, fear of strangers, yeah. fear of the other. Yeah, I never got any sense of any sort of religious tension when I was there. Um, what, what are all the border disputes? Uh, so, of course, you have uh, with Azerbaijan, which is a neighboring country, uh, following the, uh, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the changes that were going on, you had different uh, Soviet republics within the Soviet Union. You had the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic and the Azerbaijan one. Um, in Azerbaijan, there is an sort of area in the, uh, the western part of the country that is majority ethnic Armenian but yet it's a part of Azerbaijan. Oh. So and there's so, a dispute there. So after, after the fall of the Soviet Union and there wasn't this outside force projecting itself onto oh. the two parties, uh, there was a war that occurred in the early 1990s between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and Armenia ended up occupying an area that is um, de jure under Azerbaijan authority. And that continues to this day, actually, where you have Armenian troops in that uh, region called Nagorno-Karabakh. And the United States has been off and on trying to resolve this dispute for a number of years, but it's a very difficult one to resolve because there's a lot of tensions involved. And then they're upset with Turkey because Turkey doesn't want to admit to the Armenian genocide. Yeah, I think there's, there's competing, uh, you know, sort of regional uh, conceptions of the events of the early part of the 20th century and Turkey is very uh, defensive about what was going on as the Ottoman Empire collapsed and you had these movement of people and uh, these deaths that occurred in, among the civilian population and that to this day almost a hundred years later coming up on the uh, anniversary of that you have um, this dispute causing, you know, Turkey and Armenia to have a closed border since the early 1990s, the border with uh, Turkey has been closed. You know, you'd think they could do the same thing that the German people did, which is say, yep, our bad, but we are the grandchildren, are now great-grandchildren of that generation. We're not them. Mm -hmm. And go on with their life instead of getting hung up yeah. on this one point. But of course... That's your job it's to how, convince how, them as an intern in the embassy. Yeah, it's, I and guess then it's, Georgia uh, is another mm -hmm. border. 
Georgia, I think our, Armenia's relationship with Georgia is probably among the more cordial. Um, they are, of course, more similar culturally. They're both uh, Christian countries. But again, I mean, there's, uh, you know, they both have relationship with Russia, and there's, uh, you know, there's competing um, sort of maybe visions about Russia's role in the region that are, of course, the Russia-Georgia right. war that happened in 2008. Yeah. Uh, has caused Georgia to be a lot more uh, apprehensive about what Russia's role in the region is. Yeah. And as a result, you know, Armenia having uh, bases, Russian bases in its country and border uh, guards, you know, some of the border guards with other countries are Russian soldiers. So Armenia is sort of uh, holding on to that relationship a little more. But of course, you have Armenia is not border Russia. Georgia yeah. is in between. Yeah. So it's caused, caused a little bit of tension there. And just tell me what other countries there are bordering Armenia. So we, we talked about Azerbaijan, we talked about Turkey. Uh, to the north is Georgia and to the south the last one is Iran. So the four countries, so right. Four countries. And so it actually, in American eyes, its closeness with Iran is not what we would really prefer, mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, I, obviously, so they're bordering Iran. There's always going to be some sort of relationship. Uh, but Armenia, um, you know, Armenia ha has to pursue, um, you know, its own national interests, I would say. And so we just want to make sure that its its relationship, I think, is, is a healthy one um, and reflects with us. sort of right. with us and yeah. that we want to make sure that there's there's a strong connection between Armenia and the United States because of this large diaspora community that exists. Um, I think in California you have Glendale, California, which is what I learned when I was there is uh, the city in California that has 25 percent of the people there I think are of Armenian origin. So and another place closer to home too. Another place closer to home. So um, in Watertown, Massachusetts there's actually a, a large substantial. So this is sort of like the uh, Cuban diaspora. Mm -hmm. Uh, except that they're not angry at their mm -hmm. country. And so we give a lot of support mm -hmm. to Armenia, which surprised me. You said they're number it's one a, in... So there's, it's a small, fairly small country of about three million people um, and you know, not so large uh, in terms of land air area either. But uh, in terms of the level of U.S. commitment, um, at least in recent years, I'm not sure about this yeah. year in particular, but the amount of aid that the United States uh, agents, um, Agency for International Development, uh, those levels are actually the highest per capita for Armenia than any other country because of the amount of money going in. So there's and yet a we never hear a word about Armenia. Yeah, well, papers. I think it's because the relationship is just sort of going. There hasn't been a lot of yeah, drama, it's and it's well. sort of going well. So you don't and hear about the good news. And we have a lot of Peace Corps volunteers? Yeah, a lot. I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but close to 100, again, in a, a small country. And in, right. I'm sure in some countries that have Peace Corps volunteers, you know, you need to travel a long distance to see a fellow volunteer if you're in some country in Africa or something like this. But in Armenia, you know, many of the villages um, across the country have a volunteer, and you need only sort of go down the road and meet a fellow American who is did you, volunteering. Did you get to travel on the weekends into the regions, as they're called, mm -hmm. the more? Familiar? Yeah, I, I, I traveled uh, to a couple different places. Um, obviously, um, I live most of the time in Yerevan, but. Which is the capital Which of Armenia, cap Yerevan. Yes. I now know that. Yeah. <laughs> so I lived in Yerevan for most of the time, but I managed to. Uh, travel to uh, some of the, the other uh, regional sites. There's a lot of antiquities in Armenia uh, that one wouldn't really think of, you know, monuments that are, uh, you know, over a thousand years old in the country. And, and, and what is the difference between living in Yerevan and, say, if you had been assigned to some small village? Is it a big I'd say, yeah, it's a, it's a very big uh, difference. I think almost half the country lives in Yerevan or the greater Yerevan area. For the rest of the country that lives in the regions, you have uh, not as reliable access to things like water or electricity or anything like this. Uh, so it's a very much more basic existence that people have out in those areas. Sort of like China, where there's such a mm -hmm. huge difference between city life and country life. Yeah, and I think it translates into different cultural norms as well. Uh, more, much more traditional view of life out in the countryside than there is in the capital, uh, especially with regards to, I think, um, the role of, of women in society and um, even 
things such as you know, dating and marriage. It's much more traditional, more arranged marriages occur out in the, in the countryside as well. But they were traditional enough in Yerevan that you didn't ask any uh, Armenian <laughs> women out. Well, Why that, is that? Well, I think in, in Armenia, I, as I was telling you before, it's very much uh, dating is viewed differently than the United States and that uh, uh, it's, it's viewed as sort of a pathway to marriage. So it's kind of a different, different view on and how it works. And if it's not seen as, as leading to that, then it's not really pursued. So much and, more and you weren't about to propose. So, Not, no, right? I wasn't about to propose to any <laughs> Armenian women when I was there. Yeah. So um, what happened after the Soviets? They, it was a peaceful thing. They mm -hmm. just released them. Is that what happened, or did they have to fight to get free? Oh, well, during this period, after as the Soviet Union was disintegrating, uh, countries were declaring independence. I'm not sure which, uh, what Armenia was in that order, but they uh, declared independence in the early 1990s. and wrote their own constitution and constituted themselves as, um, as their own country and their own constitution that enshrines their language and their culture in it. So, And it's sort of a democracy. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's regular elections um, like any of these countries that, that used to be in the Soviet Union. There's always concerns about, you know, the role of certain political parties and whether they're going by the rules, upholding the rule of law. Uh, but there are regular elections in the countries that, that have occurred. And it's very diffi difficult, very nebulous political situation. There's accusations about what is the opposition party actually playing the role of the opposition party, or are they just sort of in, uh, in the pocket or in cahoots with the, the uh, ruling authorities as well. So there's not so much. Armenia is, I think, about to celebrate its... Uh, 20th year of independence, and in that time, you've seen a flowering of civil society. You've seen, uh, you've seen uh, the country develop from essentially nothing um, at the beginning of its uh, nothing existence. You mean, nothing, uh, no nothing civil society structure. and its yeah. structure like that. And you've seen NGOs come into existence. You've seen uh, human rights become more important. You've seen economic, some economic development. They, and the I mean, emergence struggles. of a Free press. Yeah, so free, free press, press is yeah. developing as well. Right. So, I mean, for a country that's only 20 years old, Armenia is doing pretty well. Uh, but and, yeah. and what was the role of the Americans? Uh, I think that the uh, United States has tried to encourage a lot of, uh, you know, tried to show Armenia what it means to have a free press and what it means to respect the rule of law and things like this and, and giving all this, uh, you know, um, aid money is sort of conditional on our Armenia. They, they had the uh, Millennium Development Corporation, which was in Armenia, administering these funds according to uh, these human rights standards. And um, actually, because they did not meet sort of the standards of Georgia, then some of this money was cut off um, this past year. So Armenia is still struggling regionally. Um, you know. But we're actually trying to encourage human rights. Yes, definitely. As far as you know, right? Definitely trying to encourage them to respect human rights more, and it's kind of conditional on, on at least that category of aid that I just described. Are you sure you're not just naive? I hope I'm not naive. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, human rights is something that we encourage across the board, and I'd say when you talk about countries like China, and uh, I think you're in a different category, you know, trying to encourage human rights there. Uh, is much more of a task because we're so much more dependent on China for our trade. But for but a small country like Armenia, uh, to encourage human rights is just in the interests of regional stability right. and what we want. And one thing is Armenia has no oil. You were saying, uh, unfortunately, but actually it's fortunately because the statistics are that the countries with large supplies of oil have the greatest disparity, discrepancy between the super rich and mm -hmm. poverty really poverty-ridden masses yeah. because it becomes a fight for who gets that money, whereas, you know... So I they call I it uh, Dutch disease, you know, the idea oh. that, you know, they, uh, because they have these resources, they have less incentive to develop a democratic civil society compared to other countries. So, yeah, from that Right, they have all that, all those resources, and yet none of it filters down mm -hmm. to the population. Anyway, I hope you're right because I know in Bolivia we were not supporting human rights I went there on a mission, and we were, in fact, undermining them. But mm. I, 
I, I want to believe you that we're doing <laughs> just the right thing in helping Armenia develop into a greater mm -hmm. democracy. So do you have your eye on any country next you're going to graduate soon? Mm -hmm. Graduate soon, definitely. Um, I think uh, I might turn back towards the Middle East. It's, of course, where I so studied a lot of... So much is happening there. Yes, exactly. Did yeah. any of your professors have any idea that there would be an Arab Spring? Well, this was funny because I was taking classes, you know, uh, starting in January of last year, and usually these classes on Arab history and culture are not uh, current events right. classes, but we had events, you know, we say, oh, the president of Tunisia is out this week, the president of Egypt's out this the next week, so there, it was more of a, a current events class that we had to discuss these happenings as they were occurring. You know what's so strange is we've sent all these forces in to create democracy in places like Iraq where there isn't any and to um, uh, Afghanistan and yet where we were not didn't have any forces all those places at least made an attempt yeah uh, yeah we'll see how it, how it goes I mean I think so, it's yeah. uh, the jury's still uh, out on whether these countries will actually we'll develop actually into to, democracies yeah. and of course you to go back to Egypt yes I'll, I'll be going back to Egypt in in uh, very short time, and I'll be uh, studying uh, studying Egyptian political party development there for about three weeks. Um, as part of one of your courses. As part of we, uh, everyone does a uh, research contingent abroad. So I'll be looking at Islamist political parties in Egypt for while I'm studying there. So, looking at how these parties that uh, these groups of people that disavowed democracy and disavowed politics as something that was un-Islamic and uh, not to be uh, participated in to less than a year later they are now running in the elections and the specific group that I'm studying the Salafis have uh, gotten 20 percent of the vote uh, yeah. so no one would have thought that that would be the case right. if you looked at it a year ago but anyway congratulations Dan uh, bon voyages <laughs> And I hope you keep your mother informed of what's going on. Do you <laughs> oh, talk of politics course. with her so she can tell me? Yes, I, I'll, I try to keep her uh, informed of what I'm yeah, doing. And when you're the head of an embassy, we'll come <laughs> visit. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Because an idea, this time has come, cannot be stopped by anyone. Plant your seed. In federal ground, there ain't nothing gonna keep it down. Oh, we can do it. Yes, we can. We can change things throughout the land. But we all must lend a hand. We can do it. Oh, yes, we can.